So aside from phonological development, we also need to discuss semantic development. So one way to describe semantic development is really the development of the meaning of language. Not just the sounds now, but putting meaning behind those sounds. Having a vocabulary, having a lexicon, which is a fancy word for vocabulary in a sense. And what we know is that although we're cooing and babbling for the first year of life, we really produce our first meaningful word roughly around our first birthday. That's when it on average tends to happen. And different things can speed this up or slow this down. And once we learn that first word, different things can help us along. One of the most important things to help us with our semantic development is infant directed speech. This has had lots of other names over the history, sometimes called baby talk or motherese. We tend to use the word infant directed speech because it's not about the speaker, it's about the audience. And when we speak to a baby, what tends to really happen is we speak with a higher pitched tone, we speak a little bit slower, and we use that rising intonation. So it's the idea that you may say to another adult, oh, look at that dog. But you're gonna say to a baby, oh, look at that dog. You're gonna slow down, say it much higher, and have that rising intonation. This helps them with a lot of complex things like word segregation. They can hear the differences in the words. Look at that dog. And so you emphasize the phonemes a little bit longer. You're usually pointing at something, which helps them to map the meaning onto it. And it really helps them to add more words to their lexicon and to their vocabulary. Now when we talk about semantic development, another unit of language we have to talk about, rather than phonemes, which were the smallest unit of sound, we have to talk about morphemes, which are the smallest unit of meaning. And so when we're talking about morphemes, it's important to understand we're still talking about spoken language, not written language. So these can be a lot harder to navigate if you think about them in a written sense. But we just think about how we hear these words, it might be more helpful. So if we have the word cat versus cats, we can have two different parts to the word cats. I'm not really pronouncing my T as is pretty common in my dialect. But what we have is we know there's one part that gives us information about the noun that we're talking about cat and one, and one piece of information that tells us there's more than one. There's a plural and that's the s sound at the end of cats. And so the word cats has two morphemes. The singular cat only has one morpheme, and that's just telling us about the noun. So a morpheme is the smallest unit of meaning in a word. This is important that it mean it's important that it maintains the same meaning. Although the word cat could include the word at, at, we wouldn't consider that a morpheme because it's changing the meaning of the word. Let's try another. The word clock only has one morpheme, and that's because we don't break it into lock. That would change the meaning. So clock has one morpheme, it's one clock, versus clocks has two morphemes, and one, the S, is not a word in and of itself, but it's a morpheme, which is telling us there's a plural. So lots of morphemes can be grammatical morphemes that tell us about plural or tell us about the verb tense. For instance, if we had the word jumped, jump -ed, is different than jump, because it has an extra ed at the end telling us it's past tense. Or jumping, the ing is a second morpheme telling us that it's currently happening. Or if we have a string of words like swimming pools, we can see the phrase swimming pools actually has four separate morphemes telling us about verb tense as well as the plural nature of things. But sometimes you can actually have a word that has multiple morphemes even if it doesn't have past tense or plural. The word playground is considered a compound noun and that's because it's a ground at which we play so it would have two morphemes. We can do this with other compound nouns such as textbook, that is a book with text. Textbook is different than a book and different than text. And we can also do this with words like classroom. It's a room in which class happens. Now classroom might have two morphemes but does mushroom? No, mushroom doesn't because breaking that down into mush and room, it's not a room of mush. That would change the meaning. So it only has one morphine. So this is a lot easier if you think about it, just the way we hear language. If you hear the word jump versus jumping versus jumped, you can hear the differences and how the morphemes play a role and add meaning to our spoken language. And so early on in the lifespan, we become aware of this. Even if the morphemes change the phonemes, like child versus children, children has two morphemes. It's children that's broken up. And so morphemes becomes very important when it helps us to navigate and speak and make sense of what others are saying around us. 
Now what's really fascinating here is although we only produce our first word when we're roughly 12 months of age, we actually go through a comprehension explosion a couple months before that. On average, the comprehension explosion happens somewhere between 10 and 14 months of age. And basically what this is, is we start to rapidly understand what is being said around us, even though we may not be producing it. The first thing that we really learn to understand is our name. And that could happen as early as six months of age or as late as eight months of age, but we understand our name. By the time we're 10 months, we might understand a handful of things, maybe 10, 15, maybe up to 30 different things we understand. Mom, dad, no, for instance. But then rapidly, it jumps from about 20 or 30 things we know to hundreds of things we know. We can then look at picture books and follow stories and understand animals and colors and shapes and seasons and things in our house and lots of verbs. And so this comprehension explosion is so powerful. The first things we usually start off learning are nouns that we can see and touch like bottle, mom, dad, blanket. Other things then become our action words that we do on a regular basis, sleep, eat, fall, go. And then it becomes more abstract things like want, scared, accident. And then finally, although these seem more straightforward, prepositions take us a lot longer to understand things like on, over, under, in front of. And so comprehension development blooms quite rapidly and it blooms before production development. So what often happens is we go through this time where we experience our comprehension explosion, but our production is still lagging behind. For, so for quite a few months, we understand a lot more than what we can display. And so this leads to some problems. This is when an infant now knows what other people are saying to them and they know that they don't understand them. This can lead to a lot of tantrums. This, this is the idea at feeding time, a one-year-old may reach out with their hand on the table and say, ah, 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 and they want something. And the parent may say, oh, you want more juice? Ah, ah, ah. you want more water? Ah, you want more crackers? Ah, and they understand what their parent is saying, but the parent cannot understand them. This can lead to a lot of tantrums. How would you feel if you felt like you were a ghost and you could watch everything, but you couldn't take an active role because people couldn't understand you or understand what you were trying to express? This can lead to a lot of frustration. Luckily, eventually we begin to catch up. And eventually, sometime between 14 or 18 months on average, we experience the naming explosion. So what can happen here is around 14, sometimes even as late as 16 months of age, we barely say about 20 different words. And the 20 different words we're saying are not fully well-pronounced words. We often just say the first syllable or the first couple of sounds of a word. So sometimes something like up is uh, uh, uh. And, some, and something like more is ma, 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 ma. And so it's very short and very abbreviated. But what happens in just a matter of weeks, we go from saying about 20 words or the first syllable of 20 words to rapidly saying the first syllable of hundreds of words. And it's amazing. Now you have to be really familiar with the child. You have to be very familiar with the context of what they're saying. But if you look at a picture book with them, they can often point to everything in the picture book and say the first syllable. Looking like a cat and a bunny and a lizard, let's say, they might say, ki, ki, boy, boy, li, li. And that may be how they're talking. And that's pretty typical for this point in time. Now, what continues on even after the comprehension and naming explosions is this phenomenon known as toddler talk. So in toddler talk, although we're producing words and we understand words, our pronunciation is immature and it's not the same as it would be in older children and in adults. So we understand what people are saying around us and we want to communicate with them. But again, they're struggling to comprehend what we say. And so as a toddler, we might say a really elaborate story and no one in the room understands it, but it sounds really cute. And this is the idea that only familiarity and context can really help us out. This can also lead to a lot of emotional breakdowns and a lot of hostility because people don't understand us, but it can also lead to a lot of really cute stories. Now, once we get over the challenge of producing and coordinating our lips and tongue in this really complicated way, we can begin to add onto our vocabulary. And vocabulary is something that is growing exponentially at this point. It's not growing in a linear fashion. And what we find is sometimes you only need to hear a word once to get it. Kids of around the age of three or four, they just need to hear a new word in one sentence at one point in time. And the brain has this amazing ability known as fast mapping. And this allows them to map that new word right into their brain with very little effort. This is the idea that the first time they hear a certain word, they understand, they can rationalize and put meaning behind it and typically use it appropriately from then on. 
is something that we as adults or university students often don't do. We hear a word, we think we know it, and then we might misuse it several times. But young children are able to do this quite well. Now what's really important here is exposure matters and we know that family background plays a major role. Kids that are exposed to more words and more diverse words tend to have a much larger vocabulary than kids that are not exposed to as many words. And we see a big difference in this in terms of if the parents at home are speaking more than one language or if the parents at home have a different vocabulary in and of themselves. Parents with more limited vocabulary or who choose to use a limited vocabulary around their kids are really slowing down the child's vocabulary growth versus parents who use bigger words and are not afraid to talk about the breeds of dogs instead of just calling them puppies, for instance, will actually help their kids along when the kids are in that appropriate zone. Remember, using Vygotsky's zone of proximal development, we don't wanna overstimulate the child or overwhelm them, but adding just enough new words once in a while can really help their linguistic development.